Rockaways Productions presents The Casey Water Show, episode 111, How to Know God, by Deepak Chopra, part one. Hello, I'm your host, Casey Waters. Today, I will discuss How to Know God by Deepak Chopra. This is part one in a series. Well, actually, I covered the book a little bit at the end of the last episode, God, Divide or Unify. That is episode 110. But it was just a little bit at the end. So in a sense, today is part one, where the whole episode will be dedicated to the book. Anyway, I got Rose with me here now, and she's shedding again. See, look at all that hair, just lots of hair. But anyway, so, um... How to Know God. This is a very interesting book by Deepak Chopra. Here, the author breaks God down into seven stages. So, God is not one, God is many. Not just in the infinite variety of his creation, or her creation, but in the sense that God can be known through many perspectives. Well, at least seven of them, according to the author. And as one advances through these perspectives, these levels, these stages, well, as one advances through each stage, each level, your perspective on God and the world changes. Sometimes you actually reverse your point of view on certain issues. But anyway, for instance, God of stage one, God of level one, well, is the God we would typically think of as God. That is, God's arbitrary. We don't know the reasons of God's thinking. Even God's judgments don't always make sense. God of level one is mainly here to protect us. But even then, God often fails in this sense, and we don't know why. God of level one is capricious and arbitrary. We don't know the will of God. And with level one, we're punished by God in the sense that we must work all our lives. But at level two, work takes on more meaning. And work becomes central for God rewards hard work. And thus, God's judgments start to make sense. God judges in favor of those who work the hardest. And this does make a lot of sense. This idea of God is prevalent in society. Sure, our idea of God is based on accomplishment and trying to please God. And why not? Because we serve God. So therefore, we must please God. And the best way to please God is by working hard. Sure. And so that's the logic of stage two, or at least some of the logic of stage two. Now, as we advance, whoops, to stage three. I have to be careful. Rose sometimes bites suddenly, like that. 
I don't know if it's on camera, but in fact, she just bit me, literally on cue, right when I said that. Anyway, so, God at stage three. Well, God at stage one and skit, God at stage two, on these levels, we are serving God and God is judging us. On level three, we are restful in our awareness. This, in a sense, is a transition phase. And this is the phase where we ask the question, can God work for us? Sure, we are here to serve God, but is God also here to serve us? I believe this is the case. So I'm a level three type person, perhaps a level four. I just barely began that section in the book. What about level five, six, and seven? I have no idea. I haven't read that part yet. Perhaps I'm a level six kind of guy. I'll find out later. The author did stress that almost everybody shares all levels in their perspectives. In other words, sometimes we see God from level one. Sometimes we see God from level four. Sometimes we see God from level seven and so on. We hip hop around constantly as our perspective on reality changes, as our attitude on reality changes, our attitude about ourselves and how we fit into the world, and thus our attitude about God. It all changes constantly. So we change through these levels, these levels of awareness of God. Well, now Rose is right above me. A living headrest of sorts. Rose likes this position, but perhaps she's really after to chew up the plant. Well, perhaps this is a good time for a break anyway. Now, let's read from How to Know God, The Soul's Journey into the Mystery of Mysteries by Deepak Chopra. Let's go to page 52. I'm going to hop around a bit describing the various stages first, and then I'll come back to them and examine them in more detail. So, on page 52, towards the top of the page, if we list his attributes, which many would trace back to the Old Testament, the God of stage one is vengeful, capricious, quick to anger, jealous, judgmental, meeting out reward and punishment, unfathomable, sometimes merciful. Towards the bottom of page 52, the favorite response of the old brain is to lash out in its own defense which is why the flight or fight response serves as its main trigger. Now, let's go to page 68. Now, the author describes the God of stage two towards the middle of the page. In describing this new God, we would say that he is sovereign, omnipotent, just, the answer of prayers, impartial, rational, organized into rules, 
Now, let's go to page 82 of How to Know God by Deepak Chopra. Psychiatrists meet people every day who complain about the emotional turmoil in their lives and yet are blindly addicted to drama. They cannot survive outside the dance of love, hate. They create tension, foster mistrust, and never leave well enough alone. Other addictions are also based on behavior. The need to have something wrong in your life, or to create it if it doesn't exist. The obsession over things going wrong. This is the what if addiction. And finally, the compulsion to be perfect at all costs. This last addiction has taken secular form in people who crave the perfect family, the perfect home, and perfect career. They do not even see the irony that such perfection is dead. It can be bought only at the price of killing our inborn spontaneity, which by its nature can never be controlled. Now, let's go to page 83 at the bottom of the page. You believe that you were created to serve God, an Indian guru once pointed out, but in the end you may discover that God was created to serve you. The suspicion that this might be true launches stage three. For now, for until now, the balance has all been in God's favor. Obedience to him has mattered far more than our own needs. Later on, towards the bottom of page 84, this is the God of stage three, who can be described as detached, calm, offering consolation, undemanding, conciliatory, silent, meditative. Now, let's go to page 97. The inner life can never be a common experience. Fifty years ago, the sociologist David Reisman noted that the vast majority are outer directed and the small minority inner directed. Outer direction comes from what others think of you. If you are outer directed, you crave approval and shrink from disapproval. You bend to the needs of conformity and easily absorb the prevailing opinions as your own. Inner direction is rooted in a stable self that can't be shaken. An inner directed person is free of the need for approval. This detachment makes it much easier for him to question prevailing opinions. Being inner directed doesn't make you religious, but the religion of the inner directed is stage three. What is my life challenge? To be engaged and detached at the same time. Now we are in a better position to understand why Jesus wanted his disciples to be in the world, but not 
of it. He wanted them to be both detached and engaged. Detached in the sense that no one could grab their souls. Engaged in the sense that they remained motivated to lead a wor worthy life. This is the balancing act of stage three, and many people find it hard to manage. Now, let's go to page 102. Here, the author describes the qualities of God at level four. The qualities of God, the Redeemer, are all positive. Understanding, tolerant, forgiving, non-judgmental, inclusive, accepting. Now, let's go to page 106. Towards the bottom of the page and continuing on to 107. In stage four, the emptiness of outward life is rendered irrelevant because a new voyage has commenced. The wise are not sitting around contemplating how wise they are. They are flying through space and time, guided on a soul journey that nothing can impede. The hunger to be alone, characteristic of anyone in stage four, comes from sheer suspense. The person cannot wait to find out what comes next in the unfolding of the soul's drama. The word redemption conveys only a pale sense of how all involving this whole expedition is. There is much more to the knower within than just being free from sin. Someone who still felt burdened with guilt and shame, however, would never embark on the voyage. You don't have to be perfect to try to reach the angels, but you do have to be able to live with yourself and keep your own company for long stretches of time. Now, let's go to page 30 of How to Know God by Deepak Chopra. In the animal kingdom, some nervous systems are much faster than ours and others much slower. A snail's neurons picks up signals from the outside world so slowly, for example, that events any faster than three seconds would not be perceived. In other words, if a snail was looking at an apple and I quickly reached in and snatched it away, the snail would not be able to detect my hand. It would see the apple disappear before its very eyes. In the same way, quantum flashes are millions of times too rapid for us to register. So our brains play a trick on us by seeing solid objects that are continuous in time and space, the same way that a movie seems continuous. A movie consists of 24 still pictures flashing by per second with 24 gaps of blackness as each frame is taken away and a new one put in its place. But since our brains cannot perceive 
48 stop motion events in one second, the illusion of the movie is created. Now speed this up by many powers of 10 and you get the trick of the movie we call real life. You and I exist as flashing photons with a black void in between each flash. The quantum light show comprises our whole body, our every thought and wish, and every event we take part in. In other words, we are being created over and over again all the time. Genesis is now and always has been. Who is behind this never-ending creation? Whose power of mind or vision is capable of taking the universe away and putting it back again in a fraction of a second? The power of creation, whatever it turns out to be, lies even beyond energy. A force with the ability to turn gaseous clouds of dust into stars and eventually into DNA. In the terminology of physics, we refer to this pre-quantum level as virtual. When you go beyond all energy, there is nothing. A void. Visible light becomes virtual light. Real space becomes virtual space. Real time becomes virtual time. In the process, all properties vanish. Light no longer shines. Space covers no distance. Time is eternal. This is the womb of creation, infinitely dynamic and alive. Words like empty, dark, and cold do not apply to it. The virtual domain is so inconceivable that only religious language seems to touch it at all. Today in India, a devout believer may greet the dawn with an ancient Vedic hymn. In the beginning, there was neither existence nor non-existence. All this world was unmanifest energy. The one breathed without breath. By its own power, nothing else was there. Rig Veda. Now, let's go to page 32 of How to Know God by Deepak Chopra at the top of the page. Now, if you can't imagine that the cosmos exploded into being in a dazzling flash of light from this one point, you must then go, to, go a step further. Because the pre-creation state has no time, it is still here. The Big Bang has never happened in the virtual domain, and yet, paradoxically, all Big Bangs have happened no matter how many times the universe expands across billions of light years, only to collapse back onto itself and withdraw back into the void. Nothing will change at the virtual level. This is as close as physics has come to the religious notion of a God who is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. Omni means all, and the virtual state, since it has no boundaries of any kind, is properly called the all. Later on, towards the bottom of page 
32, a physicist friend once stated the same truth in newer words. You must realize, Deepak, that time is just a cosmic convenience that keeps everything from happening all at once. This convenience is needed at the material level, but not at deeper levels. Therefore, if you could see yourself in your virtual state, all the chaos and swirling galaxies would make perfect sense. They form one pattern unfolding in perfect symmetry. Viewed from this perspective, the endpoint of all creation is now. The whole cosmos has conspired to create you and me sitting here this very second. Now, let's go to the bottom of page 33. I remember reading, too, about a guru who used to let anyone into his house on feast days, holding the laws of hospitality to be sacred. He was not rich, and his followers were distressed that hundreds of guests would appear at his door to be fed. The guru only smiled and made a strange request. Keep feeding everybody from those buckets of rice and lentils, he said, but first cover them with a cloth. The buckets were covered so that no one could see into them, and as many times as the ladles were dipped in, there was always more food to go around, and this way the guru performed the same miracle as Jesus. Now, let's go to page 38. Virtual domain equals spirit. No energy, no time, unbounded. Every point in space is every other point. Wholeness exists at every point. Infinite silence, infinite dynamism, infinitely correlated. Infinite organizing power. Infinite creative potential. Eternal. Unmeasurable. Immortal. Beyond birth and death. A casual. Quantum domain equals mind. Creation manifests. Energy exists. Time begins. Space expands from its source. Events are uncertain. Waves and particles alternate with one another. Only probabilities can be measured. Cause and effect are fluid. Birth and death occur at the speed of light. Information is embedded in energy. Material reality equals visible universe. Events are definite. Objects have firm boundaries. Matter dominates over energy. Three-dimensional, knowable, by the five senses. Time flows in a straight line. Changeable, subject to decay. Organisms are born and die. Casey Waters Show. Producer, Casey Waters. Graphic editing, Judson Laird. Please note our new email address, caseywaters2 at caseywaters.com.